Hi, everybody. My name is Carrie Hyde. I uh, run a podcast called The Spodcast. Most of you know me um, through my business that I run, boarding, daycare, grooming for dogs. And I started a podcast uh, a few years back just to try to educate pet parents a little bit more. And through that, I met Scott Fine. Scott, how are you? Hi, Carrie. How are you? I'm well. I'm great. So Good. I'm going to give you guys a little background on Scott here really quickly because we want to get into what how far things are going and what we're doing. This episode is really going to be about the documentary docu docu why can't I say this word? <laughs> the documentary that that we're trying to work on. So Scott started Joey's Legacy because he lost his dog and um then decided to start this entire amazing amazing organization called Joey's Legacy. Uh and through that why don't you tell me a little bit of the story of how you met Jerry, who we're going to introduce really quick, because this is how this all came about was with you and Jerry. Jerry, say hi. Hey. Hey. So I uh, followers fall, know who you guys are. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how you guys met and we're going to bring in how, how we met, how we, how John came involved in this. So I lived in Lee County, Florida up until last August, we moved to Lexington, South Carolina, uh, for a mutual friend who uh, John has met, I'm sure, Steve. Uh, I, Steve and I had a regular breakfast, uh, uh, you know, meeting every couple times a month over in uh, Northport Myers. And um, he brought me uh, Jerry's uh, volume one of his uh, series, The End. And he said, read this book. I said, I'm not a big reader, Steve. He said, read the book anyway. So I did, and uh, very interesting. And led me to read book two and three. And uh, I said, I want to talk to this guy and see if he's got an interest. I've never really uh, met uh, anyone uh, that was an author. So uh, we traded a couple of emails, Jerry and I, and then we had a phone conversation and he was in the middle of a, a, a project he was working on, but uh, he decided he wanted to uh, temporarily stop that project and uh, write Joey's Legacy Volume One. And uh, that's how we met. That's amazing. It's a, it's a, it's a, what were the book you were writing? Did you ever finish it, Jerry? No, I put it on the shelf and it's still there. And now we're on volume two, but <clears throat> eventually we're going to get there. Unfortunately, there's so many of these stories that keep pouring in. I'm thinking there's going to be 10 volumes in this. I'm never going to get anything else written. So for anybody who hasn't listened to us do these roundtables before, Joey's Legacy is fighting against veterinary malpractice. So I want to make that really clear. That's what this, this entire podcast today is really about is veterinary malpractice. Sadly, it occurs. You know, you've seen a lot of our vets that we've brought on. Um, and so we know, Jerry and Scott and I know, that we need to expand the knowledge. And so that's where our, our guest for tonight, I guess we could say, comes in comes into play with us. And so I want to introduce everybody who's watching to John Bafar. Hi, John. How are you? Pleasure. Nice to meet you, Carrie. Yeah, I haven't, I know so much about what I've learned from Scott and Jerry and, and kind of telling me a little bit about what you do. And I'm so very, very excited to be involved in this project with the three of you gentlemen. Uh, but tell us a little bit, I think the reason we wanted to do this is to kind of, you know, we're still in that process of trying to gain donations and, and get this paid for because do something at the level of what we want. I mean, we could probably get anybody to do a docu documentary. Why am I struggling with that word tonight? I don't know. But this is such an important thing that both Jerry and, and uh, Scott recognized we needed somebody at your level. So tell us a little bit about how you got into doing this and, and, and what projects have you done? In terms of documentaries? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I started out as a news reporter and uh, that format kind of only allows you to tell short stories, two to three minutes. And that was really not very fulfilling for me. So I started breaking out and doing more long form programming. So over the years, we've done things for most of the major cable networks from History Channel. I got to do a film about 9-11 called Fireboats 9-11 that actually um, was great because I got to work with my father, who was a chief in the New York City Fire Department many years ago. And then the current chief who had his job, who was in charge of the Marine Division, and on 9-11, he was buried in both of the collapses. And uh, he was he was luckily found 
after they heard his radio under the, the pile of rubble the second time he got buried. And they brought him to New Jersey and they triaged him and President Bush came by the hospital to see him and his wife wouldn't let him in because he, he was too sick. But on, nine, on the first 4th of July after 9-11, he actually met my dad who had his job many years earlier on the boat that they both served on called the Firefighter. Wow. And, um, you know, we told the story of not only 9-11, which was kind of the common thread, but also all the major stories of uh, the big fires that had taken place in New York Harbor over the years. So that was kind of a highlight one. I think yeah. one of the films that Jerry saw that he really liked the most was a film called Children of the Fourth World. And I've that, seen, I watched that. I, I enjoyed it also. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that, as you know, has to do with a woman who devoted her life to the kids that live in the Guatemala City dump and fight with the vultures for food every day. And we spent 10 years making that film and we got, at the end of the day, Ali McGraw got involved and she ended up being the host. So that was one of the- Oh yeah, they had the uh, yeah. highlights. And, um, and then uh, what other, so we did a film that's currently running on PBS called Queen of Swing about the inventor of the Lindy Hop and a woman by the name of Norma Miller who we just lost recently who ended up, I made a movie with her called Captiva Island. I met her in Las Vegas. And then I found out about her life as a dancer and we decided to do a documentary about her life. And she broke the color barrier and was the first black act to perform in Miami. She performed one of the first black acts to perform in Vegas. And her story was really just an inspirational story about love and, and how it overcomes all things. So those are just a few of the films you may have seen, you know, been involved with. So most of the the films that you have done have just I don't want to say just but uh, store more it seems more personal stories. Have you done anything that is in this realm where we're trying to get laws changed? Um, well, you know, we've done some things for rights of nature, and I don't know if you know about that, but they're trying to change legislation to give bodies of basically it's the right for all people to have access to clean water and the way the laws are written right now you know here in florida we have a lot of problems with water issues because there's so much runoff coming from out of lake okeechobee and coming from everywhere really so right. there's there's a group called rights of nature that is lobbying to give bodies of water the same rights as we have as citizens corporations enjoy those same rights but the way the law is written you know, we really don't have the right to have clean water. So that involves educating people, getting legislators involved and wow. telling the story in a compelling way to where change can happen. So, um, you know, that's one example of, you know, I mean, every film is different, obviously, but sure. The, sure. The things that they all share, you have to have a compelling story, compelling figures, something that moves people a mission. And in this particular case, you know, I think it's a film not only about changing the way things are done right now. My, I also have a kind of a big background as a uh, medical reporter. So I'm kind of up to speed on medical issues. And then if you transfer, it's pretty well over in the sense of veterinary issues and those same rights that we enjoy as, as human beings, these animals needs to appreciate as well. And they don't have a voice. So in one sense, you know, what, what What these guys are doing are giving these animals a voice, and I'm happy to be part of that. Yeah. Do you have a dog? I do. You do? What kind of dog do you have? It's a rescue dog that sat in a cage for a year and a half. It's a pit bull that was used in fights, and people would adopt it and bring it back because they couldn't handle it. And um, my girlfriend, Christine, is amazing and has – the most patience of anyone I know. She puts up with me, first of all. And then she, <laughs> she takes amazing care of our dog, Pearl. Yeah. And, you know, Pearl's just a sweetheart, but she's afraid of her own shadow uh, because she was abused so badly and made to fight and had her ears clipped. And she's got a broken tail from abuse. So the dog has come around and, you know, I, I wish I would come back and be Christine's dog. That would be a good life. <laughs> He wasn't involved in any of the Michael Vick stuff, was he? Uh, I don't know what fights this dog was in. No, I have no idea. But um, yeah. you're familiar with that. 
that story, right? I do know that story, and let's hope that Michael Vick has uh, repented and has moved on from, you know, dog fights. Let's hope. Let's hope. Um, right. Yeah, I used to work for a vet where we did a lot of the um, the ear clipping and cropping, and it was just it it, it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible, and that yeah. was many 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 years ago. So, but now working on you know this documentary that you're you're starting to work on what is going to be the process so uh, just so we can kind of get our listeners to understand a little bit of the process at the beginning stages like i feel like we're already at stage one right we got to raise the funds well we're beyond stage one because yesterday we actually started production and we did really some fascinating interviews with jerry and steve freeze who uh, scott mentioned earlier and okay. these guys are great on camera, and we spent a few hours going over the topic and educating people about, you know, the basics about the rights that animals enjoy or don't enjoy, and the issues. So um, we got into it, and then you know, with a documentary, a true documentary, you don't necessarily know where it's going to go. Um, you have an idea, kind of get people educated about the topic. And then there's always surprises along the way. But, you know, most of the docs take a lot of interviews, a lot of time, and they kind of become their own entity and they develop a life of their own. Um, so we just started on that journey. And you mentioned that um, there's money needed, obviously, to, you know, to make this happen and to do it at the very top level. And that's what we're planning on doing. So what do you, like, can you... If there were big challenges that you could foresee other than the the raising of the money, what other challenges do you think that we're going to face? Well, the unique, every project has unique challenges, right? And this one, I see if you're going to name bad actors, then you have to be sure that you do that in a way that's fair, legitimate, legal, and you stay within the law. And so, you know, you have to do something like get errors and omission insurance just in case someone decides to sue you because you say bad things about them, much as Scott and Jerry had to deal with with the book, I'm sure. Um, and then, you know, uh, getting people that want to cooperate, getting people that are good on camera, that have emotional stories that are pertinent, and getting the truth out there is really what it's all about. Because I think when people learn the truth, things will change because, you know, and best practices, even in the, you know, in the medical field for, you know, for us humans, the business model is starting to change where instead of being paid by the number of patients that you see every day, the new model is for physicians to be rewarded for keeping people healthy, which is a whole new paradigm. And that's hopefully the direction that we're going to be going. So in this particular case, what I've learned about the topic so far is that there's an incentive for people always to make money and we understand that. But if they're making money by way of, you know, ill practices and, and, and um, things that's bad medicine, then that needs to change. And so maybe there's a way at the end of this for this to be reshaped, relooked at, and for people to be rewarded for doing the right thing and providing the proper care. And that's how they're properly rewarded. So, you know, we'll see where the journey leads us, but it's a story that, certainly needs to be told and my hats off to Scott and Jerry for what they've done, you know, before we even started the stock. I think if they hadn't gotten this book written, then the, our shot of doing this film would not have come as naturally. Yeah. It's, a, it's pretty amazing to be able to take your grief, Scott, and turn it into something that is, it, it really is a true legacy to to have that in in so many people i've said this before on the show many times i've witnessed veterinary malpractice i know it happens every vet that we've had on so far i've asked if they've witnessed it they, every single one of them has either said yes or in some cases they said they've seen it often so to be able to take your grief and do something like this i i, I know is just amazing to be able to do that. It's the only thing you have left, right? At the end, of, if, if, at the end of when you lose a pet, there's nothing you can. That's kind of the 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 struggle, right? You can't even go and make it right. You can't do anything. The vets are getting away with it, and these things continue to happen. So, it is pretty impressive how far. And Jerry, for you to come on and and get this book written is just 
it's just amazing. I, I can't tell you how I have been so saddened by all of the stuff that I have seen over the years. I left the veterinary field, not just because of that, but that definitely was one of the reasons why I, I didn't want to be part of it anymore. Um, and I never thought I'd see the day that change was going to happen. And, and even when I first met you, Scott, I was like, oh, you know, I really want to get his story out. I was super drawn to your story. But even back then, I didn't think it would come this far. So I just am just it's amazed, amazing to watch. Scott, if through this documentary, that's a huge, huge goal. What do you want to see come of it? What would be the OK, we got the documentary made. That's the that, that's the goal right now to get this documentary made. But what do you really want to see come of, of the documentary? After the documentary is made. I'd love to see it distributed as far and as wide as possible uh, because this is all about educating the uninformed pet parents uh, that there is nefarious activity in the veterinary profession, like pretty much every other profession, but there's been a, a major struggle by the uh, veterinary mob to keep it quiet, keep it hush hush. And um, all of this needs to be exposed. And until there are some major changes, until there's some major reform, especially with our boards of veterinary medicine in the United States, who coddle and protect their colleagues and uh, fail to discipline them firmly and fairly, which would you know, obviously lead to a better outcome, uh, they continue to offend. There's a, a number of... Uh, veterinarians that are habitual offenders. They're allowed to get away with whatever they get away with. And uh, they know there's no discipline at the end of the road. They know their license is protected. They may get tapped for a, a thousand or two thousand dollar fine, uh, a modest period of probation, which is basically meaningless. And they continue to uh, create havoc in the lives of so many uh, pet families because a lot of them are incompetent. A lot of them are very deceitful when it comes to um, telling uh, if something goes wrong in surgery or in a, during a procedure. Uh, the majority of vets are, you know, we know 80% of our group has never had a bad experience with a veterinarian. And they're just in our group to learn about the other 20% and to right. try to educate themselves to become better uh, um, pet parents. So the whole idea with this documentary is an expansion of what, we're, what Jerry's book is doing. And that's just edging and enlightenment of those that are still uninformed. So, uh, John, my understanding is we need, we think we need about $100,000 to raise to get the documentary made at the level we want to make it. Jerry, can you share with us how, it, well, first off, is that, that's, you think is a pretty fair uh, number we're talking about? I'd like to start by first of all, <clears throat> telling me, telling everybody that Scott Klein is one of the most amazing men that I've ever met. Y'all have all praised him. I've not met him personally, but I feel like I have. He's almost like a brother. He's been through hell the last year and he's kept it all together. His passion is unbelievable. And that's what sold me. Um, when it first started, donations came in right away, but then they slowed down, then they picked up and now they picked up a little bit, but we're a long ways away. We're at about 25,000 bucks and we need to get to a hundred thousand. And I guess to some people, cause they wrote me and said, can't we do this for 20,000? And I'd write them back and say, you can't do this with two iPhones and a keg of beer or yeah. people are going to watch it. It's gotta be, you know, go first class or stay at home. Right. Why just waste everybody's time and money? And when John gave me the figure, I had already uh, gone on the internet, looked at several com companies that made these documentaries that are out there, a bunch of them. And every one of them had the same price range, which was 60,000 low budget to 600,000 plus high budget, depending on where you wanted it to go. So when I asked John, uh, I've never told him this, but when I asked him, um, I was really expecting about 250 and he said a hundred thousand and I thought it was very fair, but I didn't really know him. Uh, yeah. Since the time I have got to know him well, he's way too modest. This guy's won nine Emmys. 
we it's, it's a blessing that we have found him and the gentleman that um he interviewed yesterday stephen not only did he in, in uh, uh, introduce me to scott he also introduced me to john before i even met scott and i talked to him about doing a film about my other books and he turned me on to a film producer but he because he said he did documentaries and i went in then and looked to see what he did and he's he's just he's way too bashful he's amazing i told him today i want to write a book about him and i want to call it the diary of, of the best filmographer in the world <clears throat> Who are you going to write that about? I'm going to write that about John <laughs> Bifar. But, um, <laughs> but it, it's um, it's amazing what he's done. Uh, yeah. We need to raise the money or it is, isn't going to happen. But he's got a lot of faith in us. I mean, you know, I haven't given him a cent at this point from anyone. And um, he's already working on it. And he's sincere. He's, he's read it today and yesterday, especially today. He introduced me to people that would blow your mind. I mean. I couldn't, I can't believe the people that he knows. Now that's yeah. important. Even if we could go out and get one done for $80,000, he's been doing this for 40 years. Yeah. He goes to Sundance Film Festival. He goes to all the film festivals. He knows the producers. He knows the movie people. He knows, it's unbelievable he, who he knows. He's been to Milan and Serbian, Austrian, all over the whole world. So, I told Steve yesterday when he came to the airport to pick me up with John, I said, Steve, I think you're an angel because I didn't know you. You called me out of the blue after five years ago. And here we, here we are. Who would have ever figured that I would have met Scott and y'all and the best film producer in the world. It's a miracle. Yeah. I've, I, like I said, I've seen some of the work. I'm, I'm very excited. Have, have any of the three of you seen pet fooled? I have not. No. John? I haven't, no. So there's a documentary that came out, and it was uh, put together by some very passionate people in the industry, and it's called Pet Fooled, F-O-O-L-E-D. And it's about the um, the lying and all the stuff that goes on in the pet food industry. And so the other night when we were doing one, uh, one of the people asked a question, he didn't, it wasn't a question. He just said he could see this documentary being as important to the pet industry as pet fooled. So I, that's how I see this as being so important. Pet fooled made such a difference. When people watch pet fooled, they will go off kibble so fast. So I always tell people, look, if you're feeding your dog kibble and you watch this, be prepared, you'll never feed your dog kibble again. And so that's where I look at this. I think you guys should watch it. You'll kind of, you'll see what I'm talking about, but it, it made a huge, huge impact. And so knowing that that documentary can do that and that there's enough pet people in the world that want to hear this stuff and want change and are ready for change makes this documentary something I want to get behind in, in, in push it through and get it through. So once we get the documentary made, John, and it's done, what is our next, what can we do? So then how do we get it on Netflix? What's the next steps? Well, Netflix is one of, you know, many platforms. The good news is that there are so many different platforms out today, you know, where in the old days, it was the three TV networks and that was it. And this probably wasn't even be of interest to any of them. But now with the advent of all these cable channels and the increased interest in documentaries, you have a lot more interest. Typically, the way a film would work would be you have your typical suspects. And I have I do a lot of work with PBS um, nationally, and that's great for getting the most eyeballs, even more so than Netflix. Netflix, you know, it's great to get on Netflix, but you can also get lost on Netflix. You, people have to know to look for it, et cetera. When PBS, the nice thing about airing on them is that you get 90% of the country out right up front. And they tend to, you know, I have, for instance, Queen of Swing that you can Google, right? That's been running for almost seven years. And it airs, you know, numerous times, especially in Black History Month. But my point is the repetition and the number of times that that film is seen is unbelievable in terms of getting a message out. There are maybe yeah. other... Network, yeah. you could make more money 
uh, perhaps with a Netflix deal or whatever, but you have to really know what your objective is. Is, is, is your objective to get it out and as many people as possible to see it, or is your objective to make as much money off of it? So all those things go into consideration. And then you have to kind of line up the product with the network. Not every film is right for every network. So oftentimes to get exposure for a film, you'll do you know, the big film festivals, and especially there's a lot of big documentary film festivals, not just in the States, but internationally as well. So, you know, those are all discussions you have about the marketing of the film, et cetera. And you go to, you know, the usual suspects and where you line up the content with the network in terms of where you know it's gonna be a good fit. Animal Planet, Nat Geo, you know, I'm talking about cable networks now, obviously. Right. Uh, you know, et I actually feel like Animal Planet wouldn't want to pick this up. Well, you know, it's hard to make that judgment because, you know, the, the people that program these networks almost don't know what they want to put. They want to they're usually follow the next last big hit that they see, you know, and less and less do you have advertisers getting in the way of editorial. So if it's a good story and it's compelling and, and it's, you know, moving you know you you don't know that you know you yeah. you, you don't yeah. know if it is or it isn't a lot of it has to do with who happens to be the new head of marketing and they change all the time you know i can remember having a series that was launched on um we did a show called freeze frame for the travel channel then all of a sudden you know they commissioned us to do a whole series we did three or four shows a new head of development comes in oh no we have a new demographic now we're going after something else so that changes by the minute what doesn't change is quality entertainment and quality programming. And that's what you have to concern yourself with first. Be true to the story first, and it yeah. will find if it's well done and you get the right elements, it'll find its way into the marketplace. Yeah. How many people are going to be involved in the production of it? I know we have a lot of people that are going to be interviewed for their stories, and I, I can only imagine how many pets and stuff that you need to interview, but... What about the actual production, camera crew, all that kind of stuff that's involved? Well, you know, every shoot, like if you're doing a green screen, a lot of times what we'll do, we bring people into a studio and we'll use a green screen because then you have the ultimate flexibility of putting them in whatever environment you want or changing it, you know, and, and then that's a pretty simple setup. But when you go into the field and you want to use a Jimmy Jib, you know, that's a unique piece of equipment that gives you those crane shots that come in or you want to use a movie where you have a stabilized camera on a platform, or, you know, these are all specialized uh, jobs in the film and entertainment industry. And every setup and every, you know, shoot that you go to do may be different. So it all depends upon what, what the storytelling calls for, but it's a pretty diverse crew. And of course you have everything from makeup to sound to, you know, grips to lighting and, etc so you know some setups are pretty simple uh and some are way more elaborate so we're trying to bring people to you instead of you going to other people is that the, like i know you said a couple people flew out already right john well you know initially you want to get the story down so you do that in an interview setting and when you do it with green screen you can then put whatever background you want but if you want to tell an intimate story about a family who lost a pet, you want to go to that home. You want to see what it's like to live in that town, that space, feel who these people are, go to, you know, if it makes sense to go to with them on their job or what their day is like or who their family members are. So I don't see this as a studio documentary where everyone's sitting in front of a green screen and you tell their story, you know, that, that I don't think is what we're going after, but Initially, when you interview these people and then you say, you know what, we just interviewed 30 people, 10 of them have amazing stories, 10 of them are worth going after and following up at their home or where they live or wherever the location may be. And then you narrow down that story and you have the, you know, in, in the documentary world, it's driven mostly by narrative. So we like to use very little voiceover. And we like to have people tell the story because that's always way more interesting than right. a narrator that comes in and says, and blah, 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 blah. You know, as much as, as you can, if you pay attention to the 
high-end documentaries, they're being told by people. And that's the kind of film that I, I, I like to do. So the first stages is what stories are out there, who are the good people that are good on camera, that have an interesting story that fits our storyline, who are the experts, who are the people that, you know, what's your objective? Are we trying to make legislative change? Are we trying to create awareness? We're we trying to do both. You know, all those things come into consideration when you figure out who you need on camera and what stories you're telling. So as far as like, obviously we can't do this without speaking with some veterinarians. Is this something that, you know, I, I my fear is that the veterinarians that have seen it, who know that it exists, know it needs to be changed, aren't really going to want to come out and risk losing a license, uh, a veterinary license over it. So is this something that we can, we can do without giving their name and, and just have them talk about it? Or is that something that is kind of stay away from? I don't think people are afraid to speak the truth, especially if they know that they're elevating the professionalism of their industry. You know, yeah. the ones that are afraid to speak the truth are the ones that have something to hide. Those people probably don't want to be on camera. You yeah. Know, I, I, you know, it's almost like the same thing goes on. I, you know, my family, I have uh, several relatives, including a brother who's a retired New York City police officer. And if you bring out the behavior of a lot of bad eggs in the police force, that makes him insanely pissed off about that giving the good cops a bad name. I think it's much the same in this industry as well. So yeah. I wouldn't be at all concerned about people being afraid to speak the truth, especially, like I said, if they're making the industry and elevating the professionalism of their craft, that's what they care about. There's some bad actors out there, but the most majority I would think, not knowing enough about it yet, I would think are good people that care about pets and that got into the profession for the right reasons, you know? And I think they need to be highlighted and, and talked about, and this is not just about tearing people down, it's about making positive change. Right. Absolutely. No, that is something Scott has said from the get go. And I try really, really hard to make sure that, you know, the vets that we have that come on the show, I, they're just, they're valued so much. And there are, there are definitely are more great veterinarians than there are bad. But I think most people just assume I've seen it many, many times that if you're a veterinarian, you're a good person. Those two things people just assume he's a vet. He loves animals. He must be really great. And then I shared a story a while back about a veterinarian who, um, you know, actually lost his license because he did get caught feeding animals. So we know it happens, but my fear is that speaking out, which hasn't really been the case. We've had quite a few vets on the show. Uh, Scott knows quite a few, but the, the big, big problem that we've talked about is the veterinary board. And so a veterinary board needs to be changed. It's a whole list of veterinarians. And so that's where I think vets are going to get a little kind of scared to talk about because, but I don't know. I, I don't know. I feel like that's going to be a little bit of a roadblock, but hopefully we'll find the right ones. There are a lot of vets out there that don't use their licenses anymore that I'm sure will be more than willing to speak up. Yeah, I, I'm confident that that'll be the case. Good, good. Yeah, I don't, I've never had to find people that want to, I mean, I'm doing it myself. I, I stayed in the closet for a long time, not wanting to talk about the problems, but now I'm like, fine, take everything away from me. I'm not going to keep quiet anymore. Well, if you approached a vet, I wouldn't come into him and say, hey, we want to really expose all the awful people in your, in your industry. Right. And say, we want to take a look at who's doing things right and how it can be improved. And I think if, you, if you approach it from that perspective, yeah. then, then you're fine. And then, you know, there's going to be people we know are bad and we're going to go after and try to do, you know, the 60 minutes approach perhaps to, and they're going to be a little pissed off, I would imagine. But, yeah. you, you know, I mean, if you look at films done by people like Michael Moore and yeah. the likes, you know, there's yeah. ways of handling that and staying out of prison, <laughs> you know, Good. making Good. the film and not being arrested, you know, so. But our objective, you know, at least from what I've heard from everybody that's been involved, is not to villainize any individual, but to, you know, make this industry, you know, better and more yeah. respectable and protect and educate people to where, you know, the best good comes to these animals that don't have a voice. Yeah, yeah. I think, it, you know, changing the animals from being considered 
property to being Cynthian beings. Yes, I think we lost you. And I'll take over the we show now since we lost our host. Scott, way to go. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. Thank you. And you live uh, in the county. I, I, I guess we never had a chance to cross paths, but well, Steve Freeze was a great, is a great individual and so glad that he uh, knew you and spent time with you. Uh, Steve's wife and my wife have known each other for 25, maybe 30 years. I've known Steve uh, uh, most of those years as well. Uh, he's a great guy. Uh, you may not know me, but I remember I worked for Lee Health for 24 years. I retired out of there. Oh, yeah, so I, was, I remember your reports on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What was that? Uh, Wink TV or what? Uh, yeah, I worked on both Wink and NBC, CBS and NBC yeah. as, as well. But you yeah. know, the, I'll tell you a quick story about Steve Freeze. You know, as you know, he was uh, also sold orthopedic, you know, um, yeah. prosthesis and. <laughs> Yes. I was doing this film in Guatemala, and I told him about a little boy down there that needed an arm. And he came down and donated his time and created an arm for this child that had a um, birth defect where he had basically no arm below his, his elbow. And the prosthesis lasted for however many years, and then, you know, he kind of outgrew it. And Kari, the girl that runs the school there, he said to her, well, I need a new arm. What are we going to do? And he says, well, maybe we'll just pray about it and hope that some doctors come back down here and you'll get another arm. And about a day or two later, they went to the garbage dump. And this is what this kid's life job was, is sifting through and scavenging through the dump. That's how he made money for his family. And when he did so, an arm came out of the dump truck that not only fit him, but it wasn't a left arm, it was a right arm. So it was really this kind of, uh, you know, God incident, as we like to say that occurred um you know and we we, we had we filmed it and it was, ended up being part of the film but steve was very much a part of changing that man's life by um donating his time and, and amazing services so that's how i first met he's, steve. A, he's an amazing guy that's for sure yeah sorry about that guys i don't know i lost power so i got it figured back on so well, I, honestly, I don't know, other than us raising the money, knowing what's going to happen, and how do we, you know, I, gosh, how amazing if this could win an award, right? So how does that yeah. get this thing going, and then how does it, I don't even know, how do you get an award-winning documentary? Well, you start off by making a difference, and if you make a difference, the rest follows. And yeah. the awards stack up, and they collect dust. And that's all great. But what's more important to me is to make a difference and to have the film right. a positive change. So that's right. the kind of award that I'm looking for is, is positive change. Sure. I agree. I just think that like once if it were to win an award, you would know that it was it was seen enough, you know, and it would it, it's going to make positive change. Uh, Scott's already Scott, you've already made positive change. I think even even with the vet that you that you had to go through this with, with Joey. I think even that vet, it will change things. I know he didn't, he got a slap on the wrist. I know all of those things, but he has to know what you're doing. He has to know. Oh, he, he knows what I'm doing. Yeah. I sent yeah. him a copy of Jerry's book with a very special message on the inside cover. So yeah. he knows what I'm doing for sure. Yeah. That has to, even in, even in a person who, is not such a great person. It has to make some impact, I think. And so I don't know anything about that guy, but I just, that veterinarian, but I just think that, that, that already there's been some positive change and I'm excited to be a part of it. Excited to raise the money. Any, anything else we need to do to raise money guys, anything, any other new ideas that we're working on? Um, let me say something for, for John does, but this is something I forgot to tell you that he's doing, but he has a company named Peace Vision. That's who he signed in through. And he's kind of got a philosophy that the world needs more love and peace than what's going on. And he's trying to make it happen. And he introduced me to a um, top notch guy today that he's working with at Peace Vision. Um, and he's starting a podcast, a Zoomcast this week. And, uh, John has asked me to be on there three or four times with Scott, maybe you, doesn't matter, but he wants to promote it as much as he can. 
the interviews that he did yesterday with myself and Steve, uh, he's going to be making a complimentary um, 60 or 90 second spot for Lisa, who's going to offer free advertising space on her little, not little, it's a huge TV, com, uh, computer TV station. And so he's, um, and he's a brainstormer and he knows how to raise money. And we've been talking about it. And he's given me some ideas and um, this is going to happen. It yeah. really, we wouldn't be here at this point um, if it wasn't going to happen. Yeah. I'm an impatient guy. I'm one of the guys who prays to God said, God, please give me, give me patience and give it to me now. But we're going to make it happen, but I would like for it to happen within four or six months and not three years. Yeah. And, yeah. We got a platform that most people never get. And you've got a lot of members, 2,400 members, Scott. Yes. And if 15% of them are people that have suffered uh, this tragedy, uh, right. then, we, then we need to get to those because this is their chance. You know, I've never had it happen to me. It's not my chance. It's their chance. And, uh, through you, you've got, you've got it presented and now it's kind of up to them and, and strangers. I've got friends that are donating and I'm sure that everybody does. You probably got one or two today, I hope, but the, um, we have to make it happen. And when I say we out of the 2,400, there's going to be just a small percentage that make it happen, but they seem to be quite eager. Yeah. yeah. Try, trying to raise the money. It, it seems like it, you know, when you're passionate about something, you want everybody else to be passionate about it. But it is difficult when you have an organization that you have that many members, you know, even I, you know, at the spa, I have so many clients and trying to get donations has been difficult. And I, I don't know that I quite understand, you know, being a pet owner and not, you know, being able to donate $5. I don't want to come off as being this you know, hoity toity about it, but it is a little upsetting. I have to say that we are struggling still to get this change. I, I think it's because people don't think it will happen to them. And the reality is it's probably in some form already happened to them. And I hate to say that, but in some form, we talked a lot about vaccinations. And in my opinion, vaccinating a sick animal when the vial says to give to only healthy animals should be considered malpractice. It's not, but it should be in my opinion, but it continues to happen all the time and animals are still dying from that. So when people think this, their vet is, you know, this could never happen to them. Not that the veterinarian thinks that that's malpractice when they do it, but changing this and talking about this and educating people about this can also have such a other, other side effects to it where they start thinking twice about giving a vaccine to an animal. I shared the story a couple of weeks ago about the animal who came in presenting seizures and they still vaccinated the dog, not knowing why she was having seizures. So those kind of things need to all be changed as well. And I think they will be. I think doing this is making a huge difference, but getting those donations from people and getting them to understand the why this needs to happen and to protect their animals, but it's difficult. I will be doing, I told Scott, uh, I've done lots of charity events at my facility. I'm just kind of waiting till Scott feels a little bit better because I would like you to be there for it to fly out and we can do a big event at my facility where we do, we just have people bring their dogs and we do free, free baths for them and then they just donate. But we've been able to raise thousands of dollars doing that in the past for different organizations. So, and Carrie, you're in uh, Los Angeles? Orange County. Got it. In Orange County. <laughs> and it's you made, you made me think of the movie Orange County. <laughs> you what? I thought of the movie Orange County. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's bad. We get a bad rap out here, but I am actually was born in St. Louis. So I, I like to say that I'm a St. Louis girl at heart. But uh, anyway. So raising the money, we're still working on that. That's why we decided to ch chat about this a little bit tonight. That's why we don't have a vet or an attorney on here tonight. We were just giving you guys a little uh, heads up on where we are and what we're doing. Scott, do you have anything else you want to tell everybody? <clears throat> the vet boards, you know, as I like to say, the fish rots from the head down. The head, in this case, the fish is the veterinary profession and the head is all 50 boards of veterinary medicine in the United States. They are the pro they are where the problems begin and could end <clears throat> because of their failure 
to firmly discipline and fairly discipline their colleagues when appropriate has led to all of this corruption, all of the reform that needs to happen. And until that happens, they've got a stronghold on how these cases are disposed of. We have to take things into our own hands, pet parents, pet guardians, pet lovers, 85 million of us strong in the United States. <clears throat> so how do we do that? <clears throat> we find someone like Jerry to write a book and start to expose all of the nefarious activity that goes on. We're very fortunate, I can't even believe we're <laughs> so fortunate to have a guy like John Bafar on our team to create a documentary to expand on what Jerry's book is doing. We have to totally educate and enlighten the entire pet parent population all over the world. Let them know what's going on, especially in the United States, to be aware of vet boards that refuse to do what they're supposed to do. And until that happens, we have to take matters into our own hands. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, right? I know. Amen. We're following you, Scott. Um, Carrie, uh, Carrie, can you tell everybody where they can donate? That's what I was just gonna say. So it'll all be on there, but where are we where are we able to donate? I know it's on Joey's legacy. I have a link also. Uh Lori will type it in, it'll be on there. So we have all of that, but what, can you just say it out verbally? Uh, joeyslegacy.org slash donate. Okay. It's the easiest way. And this is also, Joey's Legacy is a 501c, so it's tax deductible, correct? Yes. Right. So anything that you, you put in there. Also, are we going to be doing another auction at all? Was that, that was, how much did we raise at that auction? Uh, was it over $800, I think, right, Jerry? Yeah. 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 So just keep an eye out, you know, follow Joey's legacy on the, our Facebook group and then our Scott's Facebook group. I have all of the information on mine, which is the spa. So you can con contact us there as well. Any other things you guys can think of, we should be letting them know about this documentary. I want to say a special thanks to, I'm not going to mention names, but there are a few people, gentlemen and women that are going way beyond the call of duty. They're selling stuff, they're raising money, they're doing uh, GoFundMes and birthday fundraisers, and they know who they are, and um, we all love them. Yeah, Absolutely. what is Amazon? So I know I connected my Amazon account as well, so anytime I buy anything off of Amazon, it goes through Smile. We also have that going, correct? So anybody who's right. watching can yes. go, through, go through the Smile thing on um, Amazon. You know, it may seem like it's nothing, but you're shopping anyway. So you don't have to do anything except go on Amazon and do that. So that's a great point. Yeah. yeah. And the, the last thing I'll leave you with is that we will be covering and doing more stories as we interview all of you. And if you go to peacevision.com, um, not only will you learn more about this particular project, but uh, there's a lot of other great charities that we profile there and some, you know, great tips and entertainment to bring more peace into your life. So if you get a chance, check out peacevision.com. In fact, if you subscribe, you'll get a daily free peace gram, which is a video with amazing footage, aerial footage with a little quote to start your day, inspirational quote. So oh, wow. check it out. Say that one more time. Peacevision.com. Sign up for your free peace gram, which you get every day to start your day. Little inspirational quote with music and stunning video and uh the site itself has great stories in all areas that you can bring more peace into your life whether it's about relationships finances health environmental issues spirituality and great nonprofits. all can okay. be found at peacevision.com that's amazing we do need that it, it i don't know if covid just brought it out or it's gotten worse i don't know what's going on but we definitely need that i think you'll enjoy the site yeah, I'm going to check it out. So, mm -hmm. all right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and sign us off here a little bit. Please make sure anybody that's watching this, please share this everywhere. If you don't have the ability to donate, you definitely can be sharing this. The more we share this, the better we can bring this all together. 
and help these animals and these pet parents that are going through it. Like we've said before, this is a huge problem and we need to address it. We need to change change the way things have been done in the pet industry for, for way too many years. So uh, Scott, thank you as always so, so very much for thank your you passion. Much your diligence, your continued, continued fight to make the death of Joey not go in vain. I, I appreciate Certainly. and love that so much about you. Thank you so much. Uh, and a pr praise to these two guys, because these two guys are really accelerating what I started. Yeah. They're really yeah. taking to new heights. Definitely, John. I can't. I'm so glad that you came on board with this. I'm, I wanted to know if you had a dog, because I love that... If you didn't, it wouldn't make that you couldn't do a good documentary, but the fact that you do and you understand the passion is is a little bit better somehow. It just is because not everybody has pets and not everybody loves pets. And so we didn't just get a award-winning documentarian, but also a pet lover. So that's just a bonus for all of us. So that's just amazing. So Pleasure thank you. to meet you. Yeah, thanks for having us on and we look forward to more. Yeah, yeah. Jerry, the book... Uh, what an amazing, amazing thing. I know that you're, it, it's a sad thing that there's so many volumes that you can do, but it's just, it, I, I show this all the time and I want everybody to understand that we do this for the pets and so that no one ever, ever has to go through what Scott had to go through and so many people that are in the book that have had to do that. So please buy the book, read the story. Some of the money goes to the documentary and just keep sharing this and get this information out there as much as we can. And of course, if you can donate, please, please donate. Every little bit will help. All right. All right, guys. Have Thanks a good evening. <laughs> See you Sunday.